What's up, guys? And welcome back to the channel. It is I, Infinite J. Thank you guys for tuning in with me. Right now, we have another video um, from with the Kamar Rouge incident that took place years ago, back in the 60s. Um, a lot of traumatic stuff happened. So I wanted to do this video because I love history and I want to present this history video with you guys. Um, this is the Pol Pot, Kamar Rouge and the Killing Fields documentary. Um, it is a very extended video, so or an ex an extensive video. Um, but I want you guys to watch it with me. I want to watch it with y'all. So yeah, man, that you tuned in, let's begin with Infinite J's latest trends. Let's go on over here to the screen where we're gonna have the video and let's get ready to play that there. Let's do it, guys. Let's do it. The man known to history as Pol Pot was born with the name Salot Sa in the village of Prexpal in northeastern Cambodia at some time in the second. So this Salot Sa character, his name is actually very relative to my son Elazar, which my son name is spelled E-L-I-Z-A-R, Elazar. This guy name is Salot Sa. So it's kind of interesting. It's, that's pretty neat. Wait a minute. Why we don't have visuals? Let's get that straight. Now I gotta take it back for you guys so that y'all can see the beginning, which is nothing. Y'all didn't miss nothing but some flying birds, but let's go. My apologies. Look at that house right there in the middle. The man. Right here in the. Oh, y'all don't see my arrow. I took it off, but yeah. Y'all see the house? Y'all see that? Crazy. There's a couple of them out there. Who is this pulling in my driveway? One moment, guys. So they use my driveway to turn around. <sighs> people, 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 people. Hold on. Look like they're coming over here. I thought I had visitors, man. Anyways, back to the video. And known to history as Pol Pot was born with the <laughs> name Salot Sa in the village Salot of Prexpal in northeastern Cambodia at some time in the second half of the 1920s. Official records place his birth date as being on the 25th of May 1928, but others have suggested a date of birth over three years earlier, on the 19th of May 1925. Wow. Given the age that we know that Salot began his education, the latter date of 1928 seems more likely. He was known as Salot Tsar for over 30 years, and as we will see, the name Pol Pot oh, was a revolutionary pseudonym, which he gradually began using during the 1960s, one of many he later employed, hmm. although it was the one by which he was most commonly known. Okay. His mother was Sok Nim. And his uh, May birthday, May uh, 19th, that's very close to my birthday, to say the least. That's too close. Not the 1925, of course. I'm a 90s baby. A pious Buddhist who had nine children, of oh. which Sa was the eighth, and okay. his father was Salot Pem, a relatively wealthy farmer in the Prexpal region of mixed Khmer and Chinese ethnicity. Both then, as now, Prexpal was a very small fishing village on the Seine River, and since Salot Pem owned over 20 acres of rice-growing wow. paddies and a small herd of cattle, he was one of the district's most affluent individuals. I mean, that's, that's doing pretty good for yourself. You have 20 acres back in those days. I mean, you're talking, what, 
80 years ago with 20 acres. Wow. So your great great grandchildren have inherited a nice life. As such, the man who would one day become known as Pol Pot grew up in an affluent upper middle class family, an important point to remember when evaluating his later ideologies. Any account of Pol Pot's life and career must be understood against the backdrop of Cambodia's wider history as Cambodia's past had been extremely varied by the time that the Roman Empire was collapsing and the Middle Ages were dawning in Europe. In Southeast Asia, Cambodia belonged to a number of regions including modern-day Thailand, which had absorbed elements of Indian culture but which were rooted in Buddhism rather than Hinduism. In the 9th century, a strong imperial state began to emerge in Cambodia, the Khmer Empire, so named for the Khmer-speaking people of the region. It rose in the centuries that followed to become the most powerful state in Southeast Asia. Its capital of Angkor Wat may eventually have been home to nearly a million people in the 12th and 13th centuries, but oh. thereafter the Khmer Empire declined and by the 16th and 17th centuries Cambodia had become a backwater between Siam and Vietnam. It is not surprising that the kingdom was easily absorbed by the French into their growing colony of French Indochina in 1867, although the relatively peaceful transition to colonial rule ensured that the monarchy was kept in place as a puppet government by the French. Thus, the Cambodia which Pol Pot was born into and grew up in was a French protectorate, though one in which some benefits had accrued from European dominance, owing to slightly improved standards of living and more secure food supplies. For instance, the Cambodian population more than quadrupled in the 80 or so years after the commencement of French rule, wow. from just under a million people to well over 4 million by- That lets you know how many people this planet actually have. And why do you guys think that they're always, oh, I'm sorry, why do you guys believe that there is always some type of traumatic um, experience that the world opposes upon us because we have so many people. So speaking of like the pandemic, population control, this has been going on for years. This, these things are planned. So this is nothing that is a surprise to the government. These things are, um, they're very sought out. They're very, um, they're planned events that keeps the world um, in a balance, if you may. By the middle of the 20th century, Pol Pot's family enjoyed extensive connections with the Cambodian government, including the royal family, and it was through these that the young Tsar was able to obtain a position as a novice monk at the Buddhist monastery of Wat Bottom Wade in the capital Phnom Penh in 1934. Here he learned Buddhist teachings and literature, but perhaps the more significant impact of his time here was his exposure to a system of rigid discipline. Thereafter, he was sent to a Roman Catholic primary school in 1935. This was a colonial establishment where Pol Pot was educated alongside the children of the French colonial community. He was not very academically gifted or inclined, preferring sport instead of his studies, and it was not until 1941 that he graduated from the primary school. Earlier I mentioned that this was about 80 years ago. Now that you think about it, we're in 2022. So technically, that is a whole century ago. About 100 years. Man, imagine that. Two years behind schedule. Nevertheless, his privilege and family ties continued to benefit him and despite his poor performance hitherto as a student, he was admitted in 1942 to a prestigious new boarding school, which was patronized by the Cambodian monarchy. He would remain nice. there until 1947, again indulging his passion for football and basketball over his studies. Cambodia's politics were shifting dramatically. While Pol Pot was undertaking his education, French colonial rule in Southeast Asia was weakening considerably as a result of the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe in the autumn of 1939. Taking advantage of the situation, in October 1940, 
the neighbouring kingdom of Thailand invaded Cambodia and Laos and succeeded in taking possessions of some border provinces from the French. Then, in April 1941, King Monivong, the puppet monarch of Cambodia, died. He was replaced by the French by King Sihanouk, an 18-year-old, whom the French yeah. believed would be more pliable than Prince Moniret, Monivong's designated successor. But Sihanouk would prove less of a puppet than was foreseen, and he would play a major role in the tumultuous politics of Cambodia over the next 70 years. No sooner was he on the throne than Cambodia was invaded by the Empire of Japan, as the Second World War spread across Eastern Asia and the Pacific. Cambodia would suffer four years of occupation. Yeah. Then, as the end of the war neared in 1945, Sihanouk proclaimed an independent kingdom of Kampuchea in March 1945. It proved short-lived, and French colonial rule was quickly reimposed on Cambodia in October 1945. But this brief experiment in independence foreshadowed the struggle to end colonial rule which was to follow. Pol Pot's path in the years following the Second World War, though, increasingly pushed him away from Cambodia altogether. Having left boarding school without finishing his studies or acquiring his baccalaureate, he enrolled in 1948 in a carpentry course at the Technical College in Phnom Penh. Would you look at that? Another carpenter in our history. Does it ring a bell to any of you Christian folks? Not knocking religion at all. Given his family background, Pol Pot might have been expected to follow a different career path and setting out on a vocational training as a carpenter would have been viewed as a step down for the son of a wealthy landowner at the time in Cambodia. Yet right. it seems that his privilege once again benefited him in the months ahead, as Pol Pot's academic shortcomings were ignored, and in 1949 he was awarded a prestigious scholarship to attend an advanced engineering school far away in Paris in Europe, the capital of the French colonials. At the time, it was not uncommon for the French to invite the sons of well-connected colonial families to acquire their education in France itself, the goal being to inculcate young men like Pol Pot to the virtues of French society and encourage them to want to maintain French control over countries like Cambodia rather than seeking independence. Thus it was that Pol Pot set out for Paris in 1949. However, the political climate of Cambodia in the post-war period was such that Pol Pot would become radicalized against French colonial rule while in Europe, rather than inculcated into becoming a supporter of the French presence in Indochina. Before examining Pol Pot's time in Europe, we need to look at events in Cambodia itself in the late 1940s and early 1950s, yeah, in the aftermath say, of the Second Like, I wanted to see some actual, like, footages from that time, not this modern stuff. Um, it's cool. But I, I do like to see, like, the ruins and stuff like that. Some relics or whatever, so. Second World War. King Sihanouk had succeeded in gaining some concessions from the French government to grant greater autonomy to Cambodia. The country's first elections to a domestic parliament were held in 1946, and a new, modern constitution for the country came into effect in May 1947. Negotiations continued in the years ahead for Cambodia to be given a more concerted form of independence and thereafter I mean just looking at that makes you appreciate what you have opposed to what you don't. This was driven by events elsewhere in Indochina as since December 1946 the French had been fighting a war in neighboring Vietnam against insurgents who wished to acquire independence from French Indochina. The first Indochina war would drag on eventually, until 1954, and would extend into neighboring Laos and Cambodia. It was the beginning of a long period in which events in Vietnam substantially impacted on developments in Cambodia. And for the meantime, the insurgency in Vietnam made the French government more willing to grant concessions to King Sihanouk and Cambodia as a means of shoring up support there and avoiding another independence war. Yet the concessions which Sihanouk continued to obtain in the late 1940s were viewed as not going far enough, and so as Cambodia entered into the early 1950s, the country was rife with political instability 
as many parties emerged, calling for independence and an end to French colonial rule, with some mm. also wishing for the abolition of the monarchy, which was tainted by its long associations with the French. This was the situation at home as Pol Pot arrived in Paris in 1949. The stormy politics of Cambodia had been transplanted to the French capital. While he lived on the banks of the Seine, in the months that followed, Pol Pot became associated with numerous political groups that had been organized by his fellow Cambodians in Paris. One of these was the Khmer Student Association, which met regularly and was broadly committed to achieving Cambodian independence from French rule. More extreme and effectively illegal was the Cercle Marxiste, or Marxist Circle, a Marxist-Leninist organization which met in secret to read Marxist, Leninist, and other communist writings and to discuss Cambodia's struggle against French oppression. It is important to remember that the great majority of anti-colonial independent struggles in Africa and Asia in the post-Second World War period adopted one form of communism or another as their ideological base in their independent struggles, not least because the best way to throw off European imperial rule was by obtaining financial and material aid from communist Russia or China. But in assessing Pol Pot's ideology and future career, we can largely dismiss any ardent affection for Marxist thought, which he might have claimed to have had, as in reality, the future dictator did not really understand Marxist thought at all. What little of Karl Marx's own writings he had read, he later admitted he had not been really able to comprehend. Rather, Pol Pot was attracted by the idea of continuous revolution, without concerns for the violence and humanitarian implications of it, which had become a feature of Marxist-Leninist thought in the post-war period. This unswerving commitment to acquiring independence and carrying out a revolution at all costs became the central focus of his political leanings later on, not any ideological commitment to communism. Pol Pot spent three years in Paris, becoming more and more embroiled in politics there. His departure from the French capital would eventually come about, owing to developments back in his homeland. In January 1953, as the political situation in Cambodia lurched from crisis to crisis, King Sihanouk disbanded the National Assembly and began ruling by decree. Domestic political turmoil increased rapidly thereafter, such that by the spring of 1953, Cambodia was virtually in a state of civil war. Already in late 1952, the Cercle Marxiste in Paris had determined to send one of their members back to Cambodia to assess the situation on the ground in order to determine which of the competing entities they should be supporting. And so it was that Pol Pot found himself returning to Southeast Asia in December 1952, after three years in France. As a result, he was back in Cambodia to witness King Sihanouk's call for independence from France in the summer of 1953, a request which was granted by the French government in November when it realized that it lacked the support or the military capacity to maintain its control over Cambodia. Independence had been achieved, but yeah. it remained to be seen exactly what kind of state would emerge in the new Cambodia. The next okay. 15 years in Cambodia were a period of almost continual turmoil, which eventually, in 1968, would result in the outbreak of a civil war, which yeah. was the result of the unrest which continued to dominate Southeast Asia in the 1950s and 1960s. Wow. Although the Geneva Conference of 1954 succeeded in ending the first Indochina war between the French and pro-independence Vietnamese, conflict in Southeast Asia was in no way brought to an end. Henceforth, the northern parts of Vietnam became the independent country of North Vietnam, okay. which was pro-communist, while the south of the country also gained independence as the pro-Western Republic of Vietnam. However, no sooner had the dust settled on the Geneva Conference than North Vietnam began efforts to unite the country under communist rule. Thus, in 1955, the Second Indochina War, or what is more commonly known as the Vietnam War, erupted. It would last for 20 years, with wow. the South backed primarily by the United States of America, as French what? influence in Southeast Asia waned, and the North backed by Soviet Russia and Communist China. Throughout hmm. its entire duration, Cambodia was caught up in the conflict, primarily because the North Vietnamese troops, known as the Viet Cong, 
used Cambodia as a staging base for attacks wow. into South Vietnam, with Vietnamese camps established in the jungles of northern and eastern Cambodia. But as we will see, Cambodia was also increasingly tied up with the North Vietnamese because radical Marxist-Leninist revolutionaries within Cambodia, such as Pol Pot, sought North Vietnamese aid to foment their own rebellion in Cambodia. Then we gotta do something about these ads. Action. EVE to me is basically freedom. It's a giant open universe where you can do whatever you want. Right now we don't have, have time really to relax. Gotta get past these ads. Pol Pot's path would soon collide with the North Vietnamese. But for now, in the post-independence period in Cambodia during the 1950s, he became involved in efforts to effect change through political participation. The first post-independence elections in the country were held in 1955. It was widely believed that the anti-monarchy Democratic Party would win these, and Pol Pot and his fellow Marxist-Leninist Cambodians now attempted to infiltrate the Democratic Party as a means of exercising influence from within the government, which it was assumed would soon come to power. However, the king had other ideas. With the elections imminent, Sihanouk quickly abdicated in favor of his father Norodom, and then Sihanouk established his own political party called Sankumria Neom, meaning the community of the common people, and in the election, through widespread voter intimidation and fraud, Sankum won over 80% of the vote, effectively establishing a one-party dictatorship with Sihanouk. See, I'm the type that likes to go out and help and be in the mix of the environment of like environmental cleaning, you know, that, that type of situation. But it's like, we need more than just one person. That's neither here nor there. Serving as prime minister. As a consequence of the manner in which independence quickly gave way to conservative dictatorship headed by the former king, Pol Pot spent the next few years in a kind of political wilderness. He continued to be active within Marxist-Leninist circles in Cambodia, but these had largely been driven underground by Sihanouk's seizure of power, and for the time being, a concerted armed struggle by either the Communists or the Democratic Party seemed elusive. Meanwhile, Pol Pot acquired a job teaching history, geography and literature at a private school in Phnom Penh, and in 1956 he married Q. Ponnery. Political oppression continued throughout these years, with senior members of the Democratic Party being subjected to public humiliation and physical attacks during a supposedly official debate in August 1957. However, by the end of the decade, resistance to Sihanouk's dictatorship was greatly diminished. And then, things started to change. In 1959, members of the Marxist-Leninist Cambodian movement established the Kampuchean Labour Party, the forerunner of what would later become the infamous Khmer Rouge. In late September, 21 senior members of the party, including Pol Pot, met in a room of a railway station in Phnom Penh where they agreed to rename the party as the Workers' Party of Kampuchea, and party positions were allocated. Tu Samot was made general secretary, while his ally Nguyen Chia was appointed as his deputy. But Pol Pot was elected to the bureau, and was effectively third in command of the new revolutionary party. He would not have to wait long before he ascended to a position of leadership when Tu Samot was killed by the Cambodian government. Less than two years later, Pol Pot would be elected as his successor, and as the second in command, Nguyen Chia decided to step back from the revolutionary struggle. But Samot's death was also part of a wider crackdown on the socialist movement in Cambodia, and even before Pol Pot had officially been appointed as the new head of the Workers' Party, he was forced to flee with his wife to a Viet Cong encampment near the border between Cambodia and South Vietnam. It was the beginning of the drift towards civil war, and the horrors that followed in its aftermath in Cambodia. Pol Pot spent the next half a decade largely living in encampments in the jungles of Cambodia and Vietnam. His personality as a dictator was formed during these years. He was a somewhat enigmatic character, one who displayed a large level of self-control. So now, so now let's do a brief summary. 
Um, I'm kidding. ...and was reserved and introspective. Nevertheless, despite his taciturn character and the deplorable nature of his later crimes, many are agreed that he could be charming when a situation necessitated him to be so, while his varied upbringing and middle years had seen him develop an ability to interact with people from many walks of life, yet behind the apparently amiable facade lay an individual with a great thirst for power, a propensity for savage violence, and a personality that was increasingly paranoid. None of this was alleviated in any fashion by his personal circumstances. His wife suffered from deteriorating mental health in the 1960s, which would descend into chronic schizophrenia in the 1970s. Pol Pot and she would eventually divorce in 1979, and although he remarried later in life, he never enjoyed much of a family life, having just one child, a daughter who was born in the mid-1980s, when he was in his late 50s. Equally, he suffered from very poor health throughout his adult life, with insomnia and intestinal ailments, conditions which would have done nothing beneficial to stabilize an already erratic personality. Above all, if we are to seek to discover who Pol Pot was and what motivated him, we must remember that he was an ardent Cambodian nationalist and one whose tendencies in this regard were heightened in the 1960s. We do live on a beautiful planet, I, I'll say that. I'll say that. As he built up opposition to Sihanouk's regime in the wayward north and east of the country, and if there is any consistency to his actions, it is surely found in his zealous desire for Cambodian independence from French rule and the monarchy epitomized by Sihanouk. As well as being formative in his personal development, these years in the jungle were a time of growth for the Cambodian communist movement, as Sihanouk's repressive regime gained more and more enemies. More revolutionaries fled from civil society into the jungles to plot revolution. Here, they found a new umbrella organization for their resentment. The Workers' Party renamed itself in 1966 as the Communist Party of Kampuchea. But at the southwest in Phnom Penh, Sihanouk had begun referring to the party's members as the Khmer Rouge, meaning Red Cambodians. And although Pol Pot and his followers initially rejected the term themselves, it quickly gained traction and is the name most typically used for the Communist Party of Kampuchea today, a byword for the terror which would occur years later when Pol Pot came to power. But beyond this name change, the party was also evolving in new ways. During the mid-1960s, first and foremost, it was developing its own independent streak, wishing to break away from the North Vietnamese. Secondly, it had set out on a new ideological course, one which appreciated that the vast majority of Cambodians were actually farmers. As a result, any Marxist-Leninist revolution in Cambodia would not be driven by an urban proletariat such as Marx had envisaged a hundred years earlier, and which had occurred to some extent in Russia in 1917. Rather, the undeveloped state of the Cambodian economy dictated that this would be a revolution of the rural peasantry in Cambodia, so much of which had been impoverished by French colonial rule and that of the collaborationist monarchy, the continuation of which was epitomized in the form of the former king and current dictator Sihanouk. Finally, the major factor at play in these years was the growth of the party and its military capabilities, by 1967, it had several thousand members who were armed in the jungles of northern and eastern Cambodia, waiting to take action against Sihanouk's one-party state. They struck in the first days of 1968. It was the start of a long and bloody eight-year civil war. The Cambodian Civil War was initiated in January 1968, when Pol Pot's insurgents attacked an army base at Bai Damran, south of Batambang the regional capital of northwest Cambodia. Sihanouk's initial reaction to this limited insurrection backfired. He ordered a violent crackdown, with widespread bombing of the north and east of the country, indiscriminate attacks which were designed to hit at communist encampments, but which largely succeeded in alienating hundreds of thousands of rural Cambodians whose livelihoods were damaged by the scorched earth tactics favored by the government in Phnom Penh. Consequently, support for the revolt, of which Pol Pot was increasingly the undisputed leader, swelled in the late 1960s, 
He was now also increasingly referring to himself as Pol Pot rather than Sa, and it is from this time that the Cambodian communist leader became primarily known by his pseudonym. In 1970, the civil war took a dramatic turn owing to Cambodia's ongoing role in the Vietnam War to the east. In the spring of 1969, the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, ordered a series of bombing raids into Cambodia to try to interrupt the Viet Cong supply lines into South Vietnam and hit at Viet Cong camps and bases in the jungles of northeast Cambodia. This oh. was followed in March 1970 by the overthrow of Sihanouk's government in Phnom Penh by a pro-American coup d'etat. The Khmer Republic was now established with Prime Minister Lon Nol as its head. Sihanouk fled the country, but it was certainly not the end of his role in Cambodian politics. Nol honored his commitments to Washington, and the Khmer Republic ordered the Viet Cong to leave Cambodian territory. But it was unable to effect this, and in the months that followed, the Viet Cong, with Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge as their allies, effectively established control over as much as one-third of Cambodia, constituting the bulk of the north and east of the country. In the process, the Cambodian civil war shifted from one which had been initiated to overthrow Sihanouk and his regime to one which sought to capture Cambodia for the Khmer Rouge from Lon Nol and his pro-American, pro-Western government in Phnom Penh. Five years of bloody conflict would follow between Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge and Lon Nol's Khmer Republic, with one backed by the Viet Cong and the Chinese and the other aided by the US. Pol Pot's cause also benefited in the early 1970s from a bizarre reconciliation between his Communist Party and Sihanouk, who had fled to China following the coup of 1970. This brought the disparate rebel groups within Cambodia, who were opposed to Nol's government in Phnom Penh, into alliance with each other. Then, as the war intensified in the early 1970s, many thousands of pro-monarchy rebels joined the ranks of the Khmer Rouge in the jungles of northern and eastern Cambodia, few of them having any real affinity with communist thought, but willing to support Pol Pot's struggle if they felt it aided the Cambodian monarchy. The ranks of the rebels soared to nearly 50,000 armed Cambodians by 1972. Simultaneously, the Communist Party began to develop a more sophisticated party bureaucracy and the rudimentary basics of a revolutionary government, where responsibilities were delegated according to who would fill what ministerial brief if and when the party was able to seize power in Phnom Penh in the years ahead. These ass don't get enough of interrupting my video. As with so much of Cambodia's history since the end of the Second World War, the civil war's outcome was broadly determined by events in wider Southeast Asia. From the late 1960s, the US had adopted a policy of exiting the Vietnam War in such a way that would preserve the independence of South Vietnam from its northern communist neighbor, or peace with honor, as President Nixon termed it. As the US began its long withdrawal from Vietnam in the early 1970s, its support for Lon Nol's regime in Phnom Penh diminished, in particular the bombing raids on the Viet Cong. The actions of the Khmer Rouge in northern and eastern Cambodia were temporarily ended by late 1972. And then, in January 1973, Lon Nol declared a ceasefire in the hopes that the civil war would be ended amicably. But it was not to be. Pol Pot and his militants continued their push westwards towards Phnom Penh, mm. and it was clear by the spring of 1973 that they were in the ascendant. Lon Nol had to introduce conscription in order to have enough troops to defend the capital. But even so, the Khmer Rouge reached the outskirts of the city by April. They were prevented from seizing the seat of power at this time, only through the intervention of the US, Nixon ordering a huge bombing campaign which drove Pol Pot's insurgents back into the jungle. It was, however, only a limited reprieve. As the months rolled by and US aid dried up, Nol's government found itself increasingly unpopular and confined to a city, the population of which had swelled to nearly two million people, nearly three quarters of them refugees. By March 1975, the Khmer Rouge and the Viet Cong had surrounded Phnom Penh with nearly 400,000 troops, and it was no surprise to anyone 
when the city finally surrendered to Pol Pot and his insurgents on the 17th of April 1975, the Cambodian Civil War was over. The capital of South Vietnam, Saigon, fell to the Viet Cong just 13 days later, on the 30th of April 1975, as Western efforts to stop the spread of socialist regimes in Southeast Asia ended in dismal failure in the spring of 1975. The Cambodian Civil War was over. Approximately a quarter of a million Cambodians had been killed in nearly eight years of conflict, but few knew what the future now held in store for the country. Despite being the main... A quarter of a million Cambodians have been killed. That's uh, 250,000 soldiers. They're not just soldiers, they're men. They're somebody's father, brother, uncle, dad, son, cousin, nephew. It's crazy. It's a lot of people. Main rebel organization during the Civil War, the Khmer Rouge was something of an unknown quantity. In international circles, Pol Pot and his party were viewed as something of an ancillary to the Viet Cong presence in Cambodia. Few, though, knew what they would do once in power, nor could they have predicted the scale of the brutality which would now be unleashed throughout the country. Right. Even Pol Pot himself was a relatively shadowy figure of whom the world knew little in 1975. But that would all change in the years that followed. Having seized power, the Khmer Rouge unleashed a savage assault on Cambodian society itself, the horrors of which have been eclipsed by few regimes in human history. At the heart of the nightmare which unfolded in the months and years after the end of the Civil War was Kingdom the ideological platform, the Communist Workers' Party of Kampuchea, with Pol Pot as its leader. It had grown and developed in the ten years or so since they first began building up their strength in the jungles of northeast Cambodia in the mid-1960s. The party was wedded to the idea of building an agrarian revolution, one in which rural peasants would form the basis of their communist state. As we saw earlier, Pol Pot had little understanding of communist thought himself, and this ideology that the Khmer Rouge developed had little to do with the writings of Karl Marx. Indeed, they were directly antithetical. Marx had envisaged a revolution driven by the urban proletariat of oppressed factory workers. Conversely, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge viewed urban workers as dangerous subversives and wanted to encourage Cambodians to return to the countryside from the cities in order to create an almost exclusively agrarian society. This utopian dream of theirs would soon become a nightmare for the Cambodian people. As soon as Phnom Penh had been seized in April 1975, Pol Pot quickly made his way to the city. He entered the capital on the 20th of April, and by May had established his government at the Silver Pagoda, an opulent 19th century royal palace which had once been home to the monarchy. It was not at once clear that Pol Pot and the Communist Party would be the primary power in the new Cambodia, not least because a number of regional military leaders commanded their own power bases throughout the country. There was even an effort made to unseat Pol Pot in the autumn of 1976, but ultimately the party prevailed and solidified its power. Then the name of the country was officially changed to Democratic Kampuchea in January 1976, and it was governed by a standing committee of the Khmer Rouge's leading figures, who were named as brothers. Pol Pot was brother number one and served as prime minister. For a time, the former king, Sihanouk, was even brought into the government in an effort to prevent him becoming a focus of opposition to the new regime. But he resigned from his position in the spring of 1976 and was subsequently kept under house arrest by the regime, which is how the Khmer Rouge kept their control of the country in the first 12 months after the end of the civil war. The policies pursued by Pol Pot and the Khmer regime in the second half of the 1970s have become infamous, as we have seen. So what are they extracting from the water? Is that like salt or something? The regime constructed itself around the idea of creating an agrarian revolution with a kind of rural proletariat. Pot and his allies were inspired by the Great Leap Forward which Chairman Mao had attempted in China 20 years earlier, 
whereby he had attempted to drastically increase China's food production and industrial output in just a few short years. The Great Leap Forward failed spectacularly and is now understood to have resulted in the deaths of as many as 50 million Chinese people in the space of five or six years. But, undeterred by this appalling record, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge now sought to use similar methods to exponentially increase Cambodia's agricultural and manufacturing capacities. The ultimate goal was to make Cambodia self-sufficient and reliant on no other state for the goods which it needed. In particular, Pol Pot wished to avoid having the country fall under the influence of its more powerful neighbor to the east in Vietnam. Cambodian self-sufficiency was to be achieved through collectivization, whereby farms throughout the country were brought under state ownership and then run collectively or communally by farmers. The goal was to have the country's agricultural output increased substantially by forcing Cambodians to work as hard as possible. To this end, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge immediately began forcing the population to leave Cambodia's cities and relocate to labor camps in the countryside to work on collective farms. Conditions in these were brutal, often amounting to little more than slave labor. Workers were beaten and tortured if they did not work sufficiently hard enough. They were fed poorly, often so that camp overseers could report on high production yields, and malnutrition was soon rife, giving way eventually to death through starvation. As conditions in Kampuchea's work camps deteriorated during the course of 1976 and 1977, disease became rife in them also, exacerbating the level of mortality. Workers who refused to work hard enough or resisted directives were executed. The barbaric conditions of the labor camps in the countryside were not the sole theater in Pots, Cambodia, where mass murder was occurring. The Khmer Rouge established itself as a highly autocratic, xenophobic, classist and totalitarian regime. People from the middle and upper class were murdered in large numbers simply for having the most tenuous links to the ruling elites of past years or being seen as bourgeois subversives. All this despite Pol Pot's own upper middle class family background. Foreigners were targeted also. For instance, a quarter of a million Cambodians of Chinese ethnicity were killed between 1975 and 1979 with perhaps as many as 100,000 Muslims also murdered. The state also established itself as an atheistic regime, and Buddhism was savagely repressed. Anyone who was seen to resist the government became the victim of arrest and execution, and over 150 torture and execution centers were established throughout the country. The most notorious... Wait, they didn't say people, they say centers. 150 torture and execution centers were established throughout the country. That's wild. That's wild. Torture and execution centers were established throughout the country. The most notorious being S21, a converted secondary school through which as many as 20,000 prisoners passed between 1976 and 1979. As the months went by, paranoia came to dominate every aspect of Cambodian society. Children were indoctrinated into the regime's atrocities and forced to engage in killings. In other instances, the children of political dissenters or ethnic minorities who were killed were also murdered. The rationale of... That's gruesome, man. Excuse me, I was talking to my daughter. She just walked in. But that's gruesome. This, that's... Yeah, that's gruesome. That's crazy. Children involved in these slings and murders and it's crazy. Pol Pot and the regime being that they wanted to avoid these children growing up and seeking to avenge their parents. All of this took place in the killing fields, sites throughout Cambodia where mass executions were carried out. And of course it didn't look like this. They didn't have the whole fire and stuff. It was people. It was actual bodies. You know what I mean? In the years following Pol Pot's ascent to power, at these sites, individuals were sometimes killed using sharpened bamboo, scythes and pickaxes to save bullets. Some victims were forced to dig their own graves before being executed. Often poor farmers and peasants were forced to carry out these executions in order Torture. to avoid punishment themselves by the regime. 
Such was the barbarity of the Khmer Rouge and the unmitigated terror and destruction of life which it unleashed that by the end of the 1970s, somewhere between 1.7 and 2.2 million of Cambodia's population of approximately 8 million people had been killed. The Cambodian genocide overseen by Pol Pot and orchestrated by the Khmer Rouge was one of the most heinous and vicious genocides ever undertaken. Join large-scale battles with military vehicles. The online action game War Thunder has received a major up. Here they go again with these ads. Goodbye, ad. It is it's hard to look beyond the genocide to try to find any coherent policies which might have been implemented by Pol Pot's regime. And it is perhaps unsurprising to find that these were, in any event, dictated by the ideological brutality and totalitarianism of the Khmer Rouge as well. For instance, mm. the party's approach to education was mired in a highly repressive and paranoid approach to learning and the role of teachers in society. Upon the fall of Phnom Penh in 1975, several thousand educators were executed across the city. A new curriculum was devised, which sought to teach little more than basic mathematics and literacy, and thereafter was focused on instilling the regime's political ideology into the minds of students. Consequently, some children were fashioned into enthusiastic contributors to the state's atrocities. The health system also effectively collapsed under Pol Pot's reign of terror, with many physicians executed on class grounds. On the economic front, currency was abolished, and a barter system was introduced, along with the state-run distribution of goods. As a result, Cambodians were soon trading their few personal possessions in order to acquire basic goods. Foreign trade almost completely dried up. But most strikingly, the goal of drastically improving agricultural output was a catastrophic failure. The reverse, famine, was endemic as the months and years passed by. On the foreign policy front, Pol Pot's approach mirrored his desire to make Cambodia self-sufficient. Isolationism was favored. Consequently, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge spurned the Western power. As doesn't that sound um, too familiar towards what has been happening since 2020? ...including the US with which the previous administration in Phnom Penh had been so closely associated. Those states which Pol Pot established good relations with were usually headed by fellow autocrats, such as Nicolae Ceausescu of Romania. The Soviet Union was rejected as a source of support, despite being the ostensible head of the communist bloc, in favor of aligning Kampuchea with China. Chairman Mao committed over $1 billion of Beijing's money in aid to help rebuild and develop Cambodia in the aftermath of the civil war, and many civil and military advisors were sent to Southeast Asia to provide advice on how to develop the Cambodian economy. Although the relationship cooled considerably from 1976 onwards with the death of Mao that year and the Cambodian regime's increasingly hostile approach to ethnic Chinese Cambodians, but the most consequential relationship of the Khmer regime was with its neighbor to the east, with whom its recent history had been so entangled. Following the end of the Civil War, relations between Cambodia and a united Vietnam quickly deteriorated, and in the summer of 1976, negotiations to resolve some border disputes between the two countries failed. Thereafter, relations thawed considerably. Little could Cambodians have known at that time, but the communist regime in Vietnam would soon provide a kind of salvation for the people of Pol Pot's Cambodia. Relations between Cambodia and Vietnam were in terminal decline by 1978. The previous December, the Vietnamese had sent tens of thousands of troops over the border to contested regions and broke off relations with Phnom Penh, although it soon withdrew in the first weeks of 1978. Pol Pot responded by ordering raids along the border region. War was not officially entered into at this point, but the unrest was the spark to see resistance to Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge begin to emerge within Cambodia. Such was the anarchy and brutality that prevailed throughout the country that several regional military commanders were now moving through the country to distance themselves from the regime. In a desperate bid to bolster his support, Pol Pot courted Sihanouk, who was still under house arrest. 
to throw his support behind the regime, a sign of his increasing desperation. And then, in December 1978, the inevitable war broke out. The Vietnamese-Cambodian War began on Christmas Day 1978, when the Vietnamese launched a full-scale invasion of Cambodia. Over 150,000 Vietnamese troops, many of them hardened veterans from the Long Vietnam War, and led by seasoned military commanders, streamed over the border. The invaders quickly overran the country. Northeast Cambodia had been captured by the end of 1978, and then on New Year's Day, the main Vietnamese forces began their approach to Phnom Penh. As the Cambodian mm. army's resistance mm. melted away in the opening days of 1979, Let's Pol Pot see. and the Khmer Rouge regime began evacuating the capital. Many senior members fled to Thailand, while Pot himself headed for the city of Batambang, the regional capital of the northwest. Phnom Penh fell on the 7th of January 1979 to the Vietnamese, who now Guys, we are about to wrap this video up here in about the next 14 minutes. And um, I have to go to a open house at the school for my children. So hopefully I can finish this before I leave. Um, if not, I'll just come back to it and we can finish this video up. I appreciate the individuals who have stuck through to, you know, this far. If you can do me a favor and leave me a like. If you can subscribe, if you hadn't done so already, if you enjoy the videos and also turn on the post notification bell to stay tuned to more videos. That way you can be updated as soon as I drop one or a video has been released, you will be notified for the more. Um, so, yeah, I think. With that being said, at this moment, I'm going to. Stop the video here. Because it's coming up on 6.30 my time. Um, and then we'll, you know, finish up these 14 minutes when I get back. So, well, let's continue. I established a new People's Republic of Cambodia, headed by Cambodian exiles who had fled to Vietnam in recent times to avoid the purges of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. The war seemed to have been won in a matter of days, and Pol Pot and his regime utterly defeated. But then, foreign powers, yet again, intervened in Cambodia's affairs. Following the initial flush of victories, the Vietnamese and their Cambodian allies were stopped in their advances when China invaded northern Vietnam in mid-February 1979. Although the Sino-Vietnamese War, which ensued, lasted less than a month and a ceasefire had been agreed by mid-March, the attack was sufficient to give the Khmer Rouge and many other militant groups in Cambodia time to regroup and organize their resistance to the Vietnamese-backed government in Phnom Penh. We will be back. 